Antivirus programs are one of those things that most users never really think about. It tends to just be a set it and forget it type of deal. In fact, when I worked at Geek Squad, most of my clients didn't even know which antivirus programs they were using, if any at all. But at the same time, it's something that a lot of so-called tech experts consider to be essential in any computing environment. So in this video, I'm going to explain how antivirus works and the situations in which you should use it and really if you should bother using it at all. So an antivirus program does some unique things that most other executables on your system do not. For one, a well-developed anti-malware program is going to be one of the first programs that starts when your system boots up. And the anti-malware program is going to run with elevated privileges compared to some other non-system services that are running on your system. And the reason that antivirus programs have to run with such high privileges is to prevent malware or some other system anomaly from killing off that antivirus program. If a malicious program were to load up before the antivirus, there would most likely be some kind of function that prevents the antivirus from starting or that just automatically kills it when it tries to spawn and then it can't do anything to stop the malware. And the system level access is so that no other program can kill it off once it has started. This is the reason why you may have found that you can't close your antivirus program by ending the task in Task Manager. Usually when a malicious program first starts up, it doesn't have the same system level access. And in most cases, a program cannot stop another program that has a higher privilege level than it. So how do anti-malware programs actually detect viruses? Anti-malware programs today, they use a few different methods to detect and neutralize viruses on your computer. One of the earliest methods of detection developed was signature-based detection. The way that signature detection works is your antivirus program downloads a database of known virus signatures. And the signatures here are typically either hashes of a malicious file or a piece of code to look for that is unique to the malware itself. When your anti-malware program is scanning active programs in memory or files stored on your hard disk, it's comparing hashes of these files and looking at the contents of these files for those strings of malicious code. And when it finds them, it typically quarantines the file in a sandbox where it cannot replicate infect other files or cause harm to your system. Now obviously there's new viruses coming out all the time and this is why you may have noticed that your antivirus program is constantly updating. It's constantly asking to download new virus definitions and this is what it's doing. It's downloading those new signatures that have been uploaded by the provider of your antivirus. Now, this detection method is pretty good for catching the majority of viruses out there, since most people that are using malware to infect machines would be considered script kiddies. They aren't really skilled hackers, they don't know very much about systems, networks, or programming. They just used a random virus that somebody else created to try and wreak havoc or make a quick buck off of unsuspecting people, but they don't really understand how the virus is actually working. They just know that at the end of the day, they're getting someone's credit card info or they're making somebody have a bad day. But what about situations where you do encounter a true hacker, like the notorious hacker 4chan or a high-ranking member of Anonymous who owns at least three katanas and two anime body pillows? These kinds of hackers are probably creating their own viruses with a number of different evasion techniques like obfuscating its string contents, dynamically rewriting and refactoring the virus's own code base uh, by itself, and fingerprinting the environment that it's being run in and changing the way that it executes based on what it's found in the environment it's running in. 
Signature-based detection falls flat on its face when trying to deal with these kinds of malware because it was just created. It was just written by the person who's executing it or maybe somebody else designed it for a person. So there's no signature to actually compare it to. And if the malware is polymorphic, which is a common obfuscation technique, signature-based detection won't work against it in the future since the virus is going to have a different signature every time it runs because every time it runs, it's refactoring its own code to be completely different. Signature-based detection isn't as powerful and this is where heuristic-based detection comes into play. Heuristic-based detection doesn't look at signatures to uniquely identify a threat. Rather, it uses a detection method similar to how humans and animals would detect threats by looking out for the behavior of the threat that's in question and based on how it behaves, taking a specific action. One of the ways that antivirus does this is by running the suspected program in a virtualized environment and analyzing what it does in this environment before allowing it to run on your actual OS. And this virtualized environment is sandboxed away from other processes that are running on your system. So when a program tries to attach itself to a system process or do some other type of malware-like behavior, the heuristic detector says, ah, yep, that is malware, and it quarantines the file. Now this detection method isn't perfect either though. There's a number of ways that malware can avoid detection in a sandbox, like adding a delay to the execution of the malicious payload. This is especially common in Trojan horse malware, which usually bundles itself with a legitimate program. The malware doesn't have to execute right away. It can let the user interface with the real program for minutes or even hours before running its malicious payload. And obviously, your antivirus isn't going to keep the executable in the sandbox for that long. Usually, it's only going to keep it in there for a number of seconds because, again, a lot of script kiddies and less sophisticated malware authors, they want to go in for the kill right away. They want to start infecting your system within seconds of it executing. But if you sit back and wait, if the malware is patient, then the heuristic detector is going to say, okay, nothing's really going on here. I'm going to just let it pass over to the system. And then that is when the bad things happen. A convenient way that I've found to avoid sandbox detection during my malware research was to simply check the variables of the environment that the malware is running in. And checking these things like the number of threads or how much RAM a system has is fairly innocent. There's lots of programs that do that, and it won't by itself flag a program as malware. But when you're running in this sandboxed environment, since it's basically a virtualized container, it'll only have one or two processor threads available to it. So from here, you can add a simple if else. If there's only one processor thread, then you know chances are you're in a virtualized environment. But if you find four or more, you're probably running on a real machine and then you can start executing malware. So if you haven't figured it out by now, anti-malware is not a foolproof solution. So how can you protect yourself from malware attacks? Well, all malware has one thing in common. It requires a user intervention. And at the end of the day, malware cannot make its way onto your system unless you run a file, open a suspicious document and enable content for a macro attack, or go to a suspicious website and download an even more suspicious file. So a better solution to preventing a malicious attack is to remain vigilant, know what you're doing on the computer, and don't run any suspicious files. Anti-malware programs could still be good, especially if you're running an insecure OS like Windows, but it's a lot like carrying a gun in a bad neighborhood. If you're not remaining vigilant, then that gun just won't do you as much good, and you could still fall victim to a sneak attack.